there was Jesus. Typology in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. As we've tried to clarify along the way, we don't believe in two gods. We don't believe in two Bibles, two covenants, or anything like that. We believe that Jesus has brought to completion and fulfillment that which was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament isn't subservient to the New Testament or anything like that. Jesus himself said that. I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. He hasn't come to annul the word of God, but to prove that God is true to his word. So how do we see that connecting? And we've talked about some people along the way, Adam and Eve and Abraham, well, Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau. And we've talked about Joseph, the son of Jacob. And we've talked about Moses and Joshua. That's a lot of people. Today, I want to talk about a ritual custom sacrifice of sorts. I want to talk about scapegoats, something that is not explicit in the Bible. We read that Jesus is the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb of God. That's in Scripture. But we don't see explicitly that Jesus is the scapegoat of God. I will argue I think it is implicit. I think Jesus is the ultimate scapegoat. But to understand that, we need to know what is a scapegoat. So we're going to talk about that this morning. To help us, I want to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 8. You will hear this story and think, what in the world, how does this connect? But I hope by the end of the sermon, you'll see how it makes sense. This is a familiar story for many of us. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, it's commanded that we should stone such women. So what do you say? Now, they said this to test Jesus, that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and started writing with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, you've heard that before, haven't you? Let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. Once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. Jesus was finally left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to God for it. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we try to wrap our minds around the work of Christ and the way that he has fulfilled all of your promises to us, may we do so in a way that makes us more like Jesus, to share in his love and compassion and mercy, to receive forgiveness, and to offer it as freely as we have received it. This we do for your glory and out of love for your children. Help us through the power of your spirit. Amen. So a famous story in John's gospel. I think in some way it is connected to Leviticus chapter 16. And this is where I think I'm going to lose some of you, but I'll I'll try to bring it back together. Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 1, this is the law of Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Aaron's sons are, of course, the priestly tribe. They are servants in the temple, and they have died because they have gone into the presence of God being impure, mortal, not covered by blood. And so they died. And this is what God says to Moses. Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. So God says to Moses, your brother Aaron, who serves in the temple, in the, well, at that time it was a tabernacle, it was a portable temple, same idea. He serves in this holy space set apart for God's presence and worship. You can't go in there unless you have been properly cleansed and covered. Not because God is waiting for you to pay him off so you can come into his presence. That's paganism. We don't serve a God who wants you to pay him anything. He says elsewhere, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. So it's not like I need your stuff. What's happening is that God is so alive, so pure, so holy, that for impure mortal people to come into the living God's presence is impossible. 
literally impossible. And if one is going to die, it's not going to be God. And so the human who comes in dies. We don't understand how all that works. We just know it's true. You touch the Ark of the Covenant, you die. People say, well, I can't believe God would punish that guy. I think it was Uzzah who tries to catch the Ark when it's falling, and then he ends up dying, and people say, oh, God is so short-tempered. No, God didn't kill him. He died. Those are two different things. I would argue God didn't want that to happen, but you can't touch the presence of God and be impure or you die. You just can't do it. Okay, so if that's the case, then it helps explain all these purity laws. God isn't saying, if you'll do all this stuff, then I'll be nice to you. God is saying, if you do all this stuff, then you can come closer to me. Then you can come near. The whole point is, I want Aaron to come into the tent, but he can't do it the way that his sons just tried to do it. That'll kill him. If he wants to come in and not die, he's going to have to do this first. And then this is what we read. In this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place, verse 3, with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. He shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall, take, he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Okay, so that's a lot of animals, a lot of sacrifice going on. Here's the explanation, verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and make atonement for himself and his house. So Aaron's going to offer the blood of a bull for his own sin and for his family. Then he'll take two goats, set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, like rolling dice or something like that. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. So one of these goats is going to go to God and one of them is going to go to Azazel in the wilderness. Azazel in Jewish tradition is uh, akin to Satan, Hasatan, the adversary. He's a picture of demonic power. He lives in the wilderness, this demonic power outside of the camp of Israel. The idea is one of these goats is going to be sacrificed to Yahweh, the true God, as a payment for sin, as a covering and atoning of sin, blood covering over death. Blood of a bull covered Aaron and his house. Blood of the goat will cover Israel, the nation. But the other goat is to be sent out into the wilderness after they lay hands on it. That's what we're about to read. They'll lay hands on it and send it out into the wilderness to Azazel, to this satanic figure. The idea is Satan doesn't live here. Satan, who is a lord of darkness, a ruler of evil, whatever Satan really is like, we know he's not attributed with goodness. So this demonic figure is outside of the camp of Israel in the wilderness. So if you have sins laid upon a goat, where do all those sins belong? With their master. Sin doesn't belong in the camp of Yahweh. It belongs out in the wilderness with the enemy. Okay, so this isn't a sacrifice to Satan. It's not like that. It's a recognition that our sin has to go somewhere. This is an amazing story because the, the picture of the two goats is a way of saying blood has to cover our sin, but also sin has to be done away with. You can't have one without the other. If you get rid of the sins, but you're still sinful, then God can't come close. Blood has to cover that sin. But if you cover the sin with blood, and yet you keep on sinning and the sin is still there, then you're just gonna have to, you're gonna have to keep doing this over and over again. Well, that's exactly what they do. They cover their sin in blood. They send their sin out on the back of a goat, and then next year, they do it again. Anybody know the day of the year that this happens on? In the Jewish calendar? Nowadays, it's called Yom Kippur. But back then, it was Yom Kippurim, which means atonements, plural. They gave all these atonements for Aaron, for his household, for the people of Israel, and sending their sin out of the camp into the wilderness. These are powerful images. They're more than that. They're spiritual exercises. But they are powerful images of what is happening between God and humankind. Humans are mortal, dying sinful people. And the only way that a pure and living God can come close to them is for their death to be covered in life. And so all through the old covenant, the blood of animals is called a life force. It is the source of life. So when you cover death in blood, it appears alive. That's why we needed blood. But the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. So the bull and the goats, they're offered, but they have to keep being offered because all they do is temporarily cover sin. They don't ever take it away. So we needed a better scapegoat. So here's how it ends. You take this goat, Aaron shall present it 
the one on which the lot has fallen for the Lord and use it as a sin offering, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So the idea is one is sacrificed to Yahweh, blood covering sin and death. The other one is sent out of the camp, signifying the dismissal of sin. We got to get rid of this sin. We have to get rid of it. That's the picture of the scapegoat. What's amazing to me with all this idea of removal of guilt and cleansing from impurity and mortality and all these, all these themes that run through the Old Testament, what is amazing to me is that those themes still exist in all of human society today. How many of you have heard of René Girard? Anybody? In the last hundred years, he was a famous, he's deceased now, but he was a famous French philosopher. That's why his name is René Girard. Uh, he's French. I don't know French, but I know that's his name. So I had to read some René Girard in seminary. And he has focused or had focused his whole life's career on the concept of angry mobs and scapegoating. And he, he found connections to religious practice. But I want to take it a step further and say that his concept of social scapegoating is exactly what we see in the actual scapegoat in Israel. And here's what I mean by that. Scapegoating is the removal of my guilt through the projection of that guilt onto another. It's a way of projecting blame on other people instead of me taking responsibility. And we see that all the time. That is exactly what happens at a local level when we have little gossip groups. When you sit down at tutors with your buddies and you talk about so-and-so and what they did. And, oh yeah, and I heard about this too, right? Those little gossip groups that just sort of bubble up and happen. They're a, a very successful way of forming tight-knit community. You feel connected to people when you have someone that you share as a target, as a victim. You scapegoat somebody. Maybe it's a person who becomes the subject of your verbal violence. You attack the character of a person and you all talk about it together. And maybe some of it's true. It doesn't change the fact that you're placing all this guilt and projecting it on this person. But it's not just verbal violence. And by the way, the saddest thing about those little groups is as soon as you leave, you're probably the next target. It's just true. But it's worse than that. We don't just see it in gossip groups and little coffee get-togethers, right? You see it all the time at societal levels. We saw it under the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler. Part of his evil genius was to strike a chord with the German populace, to say, we have a shared tension, a shared problem here that we have to solve. And if we can scapegoat a whole people group, the Jewish race, and gypsies and handicapped individuals and whatever else, if we can put all these people together and say they are the problem in our society, then the rest of us can rally together to bring about utopia by eliminating the scapegoat. Send them out of the camp over the edge of a cliff, which Jewish tradition tells us is what they did with the scapegoat. They were probably afraid he would come back into the camp, so they made sure he wandered off the edge of a cliff. You get rid of the sin, right? Get it out of our camp. If the sin can be labeled as a people group, then we just eliminate that people group. And you think, yeah, that's terrible. That's why, that's why we had to end and you know, fight World War II and bring to an end the Nazi regime. Yeah, but it's not ended, is it? Because it's human. It's not just Nazism. It's humans. Humans do this. You do this. You'll leave church today, and you will go to lunch, and you'll sit down at a table at Bob Evans, and you will scapegoat a group of people, perhaps Democrats or Republicans or immigrants, perhaps Arab race people or people who practice the Islamic faith, no, you pick your poison. It's not like this went away. It's a human problem because we cannot help but project our guilt, our shame, whatever else we have bottling up in here, bubbling up in here. We have to, we have to let that out. So we scapegoat. We find a target. We get a group together. And as an angry mob, we attack it. And we think somehow that gets rid of the violence. It brings peace. But that's false peace. That's not real. Not only is it temporary, it's artificial. It is just a projecting of violence outside of oneself. Okay, so with all that in mind, I hope you've followed with me so far, philosophically speaking, with scapegoating. Now let's come back to the story of Jesus and the Gospel of John. This angry mob, and that's what they are. They're an angry mob. They come and throw a lady at the feet of Jesus. Now we could talk about this mob, the nature of these people. They caught her in the act of adultery. How do you do that, I wonder? Probably not the most savory group. So they grab this woman, snatch her out of bed naked, throw a sheet around her, and bring her out in the street and toss her at the feet of Jesus. And they say, hey, Moses says we can stone her to death. What do you say, Jesus? They have said, 
in a sense, she's what's wrong with the world today. And Moses says, if we want to fix the world, we kill people like her. What do you think, Jesus? And Jesus does something remarkable. He, he does nothing. He doesn't do nothing. But he implies nothing. He kneels down and scribbles in the dirt. It's more than nothing. It's as if he's saying, I don't have time for this. No one knows what he wrote in the dirt. The early church fathers, and I think they may be right, say that he wrote the sins of the people in the crowd, this angry mob that had gathered and thrown the woman at his feet. He's writing down the things that they do that are not so good. Maybe. Whatever it is, he says, finally, he speaks to them after they continue to hound him about it. And he says, okay, fine. Whichever one of you has not sinned, you can throw the first stone. So if there's any confusion about what he's doing, it's clarified at that moment. You think you're better than her. You think she's the problem. But you're all so deluded that you don't recognize we are all the problem. It's all of you. It's her and every last one of you. Cumulatively, humans are the problem. And as long as you think you can find a scapegoat and fix the problem, you are delusional. And he doesn't say it in so many words. He just says so succinctly in in this little pithy statement, let the one who is without sin throw the first stone. Jesus is just really smart. He knows how to make people think. And so they think, and they think. And what's happening in that moment? He has taken a violent and angry mob who are projecting their own guilt and shame and whatever else onto this lady, who is guilty, and yet they are too, projecting all of this anger and violence toward this woman, prepared to to kill her in the public square. And Jesus takes all that violence, and he redirects it toward them but not toward them like Jesus against the crowd, but each individual in the mirror looking at his or herself. That's called contrition. When you take your projected judgments of others and violence toward others, and you turn it around and look in a mirror and look at yourself, that's what leads to repentance. That's what happens when we look at the cross. We see Christ crucified. It is folly to others to think of God becoming a man and being murdered on a cross by his own people he made. But to us, we see what it is. It is the height of evil poured out on the only innocent person who ever walked the earth. It is the ultimate scapegoat. And it forces us to stop and reflect and from the eldest to the youngest, walk away one at a time, realizing we had something to do with this. This wasn't her fault. Or in Jesus' case, this wasn't his fault. It's what the penitent thief says. Lord, you've done nothing wrong. We are here because we've done terrible things, but you did nothing wrong. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, of course, today I'm telling you right now, you're going to be with me in paradise. Jesus tells him this because he allowed Jesus to be his scapegoat. He says to Jesus, I know you didn't do anything, but you're taking what I did upon yourself. That's what scapegoats do. The problem is we make scapegoats. Jesus allowed himself to be one. Goats didn't choose to be scapegoats. There was a lot cast, and whichever unlucky goat had to go walk off a cliff. People don't choose to be scapegoats. The Jewish race during Nazi Germany did not choose to be scapegoated. But Jesus did. He chose to be the scapegoat. And ironically enough, he's the only one truly innocent who could be a scapegoat. He's the only one who, without spot or blemish, without any sin, could take everyone else's sin upon his back. And again, not as a payment to some deity. He is God. He takes the sin upon his back to bury it in the grave once and for all, and then to rise and say, it's done. He says it as he's dying, to tell us die. It is finished. What's finished? Scapegoating. It's over. No more projecting violence and blaming other people. You will own up for what you have done and who you have become, and I can fix you. That's the invitation of Jesus. Look yourself in the mirror. Recognize that you are part of the problem. Recognize that everyone is part of the problem. And in that humility and honesty, come to Jesus for the cure. That's how we bring an end to scapegoating. Scapegoating, if it weren't for Jesus, would still be happening. It's amazing. St. Augustine, at the end of John chapter 8 in his commentary on the passage, this is you know the late 300s, I think, he wrote these words. At the end of the day, all that's left at the end of John chapter 8, 1 through 11, all that's left is misera et misericordia, which is Latin for misery and mercy. That's all that remains. Jesus and this woman, 
standing face to face, misery and mercy. I think Jesus worked out this beautiful picture because he knew that's what it would look like on the cross when the angry mom snatched him up and took him to a joke of a trial and accused him falsely of things he had not done and condemned him illegally to be executed. And then this mob drug him outside of the city of Jerusalem to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and they hung him on a cross, mocked, scorned, shamed, bloodied, beaten, wearing a crown of thorns. And they said, here he is, the king of the Jews. He's the problem. And they crucified him. That's scapegoating. They sent him out of the city, and they put everything, blamed everything on him. and said, if we kill him, this will all get better. That's not how it works. <laughs> Little did they know that in killing him, everything was going to be fixed. But it wasn't because they finally got rid of his sin. It was because he took theirs. Because he killed sin. He became sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happened at the cross. Jesus has this beautiful story with the woman caught in adultery, I think, if for no other reason, but to point to himself as the new and ultimate victim who will not remain victimized. All the world, Romans and Jews alike, can join forces from Pontius Pilate to Herod, can join forces and wreak as much havoc as they can on Jesus the Christ, hang him on a cross and publicly shame him, and you still can't stop him. All the violence and projection of shame in all the world are on his shoulders. And you cannot keep him down. Only Jesus could do that. And when he comes back, he doesn't come back and say, I can't believe you did that to me. He knew that's what they were doing. He was forgiving them for doing it while they were doing it because that's why he had come. His friends tried to stop it and he said, no, I've come for this very reason. This has to happen. And so after his resurrection, he shows up in the locked upper room and he says those famous words three times, peace, peace be with you. Just when they think he's come back for revenge, he says, no, I finally, finally brought peace. I brought the end to revenge. All you've ever known is revenge. All you've ever known is violence. I brought peace, peace. Only through his own death and resurrection. Jesus is the ultimate scapegoat. He brings an end to the violence. He turns violence into contrition, into penance, so that we recognize our own faults. We quit projecting onto others and, and bringing more and more violence and vicious cycles into this world. We stop sinning. That's what he says to the woman. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. He doesn't say you were innocent to begin with. She was not innocent. But he says, regardless, I do not condemn you. If I can forgive you, you are forgiven. I'm the one, it, you know, the buck stops with me. I forgive you. All these people have walked away. I help them see that they're part of the problem. You and me, we're all that's left. Misery and mercy. And James says, mercy always triumphs over judgment. And so the, the one in misery walks away changed forever because Jesus says, go and sin no more. Only when Jesus offers forgiveness can one go and sin no more. Only when he scapegoats himself and allows violence and vengeance and all of sin to be done away with once and for all. Only then can we go and sin no more. In the Bible, there's really there are only three nouns ever used to describe God. Plenty of adjectives and character traits, but only three times do we see God described as a noun. God is, and some of you may know these, there are three and they're all L's in English. Love, light, and life. God is love, God is light, God is life. The problem in Leviticus was that when hate and envy and darkness and death try to come into the presence of perfect light and life and love, they cannot remain. And so Aaron's sons die. And Moses and Aaron are thinking, what do we do? How do we come into the presence of God? And God says, I'll tell you, you're going to need sacrifices. You're going to need blood to cover your death. You're going to need someone or something to take all your sin and get it out of here. And always that was pointing to Jesus, who would bring an end to the days of atonements, who would himself become the great atonement. Yes, he's the Paschal Lamb. He's our protection from death. But he's more than that. He's the one who removes sin and its sway over us. 
he takes it out of the camp of God and into the wilderness. And there he leaves it buried forever. Only Jesus could do that. And so it leads us to share the sentiments of the ancient Israelites. In Psalm 85, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. Micah 7, 19, God has subdued our sins, our iniquities. He has cast all of them into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 38, he no longer remembers them since he has cast them behind his back. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The hope, the purpose has always been, old and new covenant, always been, God's mercy triumphing over judgment. It has always been the mercy and love of God that is more powerful than sin and death. And so we see in the person of Jesus. And so he proves to be the scapegoat. In John chapter 8, Jesus says to that woman that she's no longer condemned and she needs to go and sin no more. And I've read that story countless times, but one day I read it and I thought, where does she go? Do you ever wonder things like that when you read the Bible? But where would she go? Uh, really? I wonder if she could come here. I wonder if that's the whole reason the church exists, to give us a place to go. When scapegoating is finished, when we stop projecting our sin and violence into everyone's lives all around us, and we deal with it between ourselves and God, and we lay it at the foot of the cross, and we receive forgiveness, and he says, you are no longer condemned. Go and quit being a sinner. Be changed. Where do we go? if not the church? Where could you go if not the church? And so here we are. Have you been transformed by the ultimate scapegoat, Jesus? Have, have you received forgiveness? Have you felt the transforming power of God's love in your life? I really wonder. I hope you have. As someone who's, who's experienced it, there is nothing like it to feel the freedom to go and be changed, to feel that those who condemn you cannot stand in the presence of the judge over all the earth, that no kingdom, no power, no principality has any authority over you anymore because of Christ. To begin to realize the truth of those statements is life-altering, not just in this life, but in life eternal. And it is only available to those who have trusted in Jesus, those who love Christ. Would you stand with me as we close? All that remained at the end of that story is misery and mercy. But I'm telling you today, when mercy clothes misery, that's love. And God is love, and God loves you.